Hello there. Hello and welcome to the Meet the Mentor session from Hand and Lock. Um, this is part of the Hand and Lock Prize 2024. Um, and I can see that there's some people entering the room now. So I'm just going to give you a few more minutes to join us and then we will get started. It's a little bit scary seeing this number go up and up and up as more of you join us. OK, I think there's enough people now. And we're pretty prompt, so let's get started. Um, welcome to Meet the Mentors. I'm Robert, and I'm an art historian, art and fashion historian, and also spent seven years working at Hand and Lock. So I know a little bit about the prize, I would like to think. I know a little bit about Hand and Lock and embroidery, and hopefully we'll have a really interesting discussion today. Um, before I introduce you to the mentors and everyone that you can see on the screen now, I just wanted to give a little overview for anyone who was new to the prize. So the prize was established way back in 2000 um, and the Hand and Lock Prize strives to promote excellence in embroidery. It originally started with just fashion garments, but it expanded into textile arts. And that seems to be a big area at the moment for expression. Um, there is a, a prize fund this year totaling $36,000. So if you are considering entering this prize, you could take away a chunk of that cash. But to achieve the top spot, entrants must first submit their embroidery in accordance with our brief. And our brief this year is traces of transition, embroidery that illuminates the layers of our lives. We're going to talk a little bit about the brief today uh, with our mentors, which gives me the perfect opportunity to start introductions. So... Everybody, please welcome, first of all, Diana Springle, artist, longtime supporter and mentor and sometimes judge for the prize. Hello, Diana. Hello. And um, we've also got Kate Tume, artist, mentor this year and also a former prize winner. Hello, Kate. Hello. Uh, we've got Stacey Jones, textile artist, educator and prize mentor this year. Well, hello. Uh, Danielle Clough, who's the visual artist, prize mentor and kind of a regular panelist over here with me hello yeah hi we've got Kate Pankhurst as well hand embroiderer and 2024 mentor and another prize winner hello Kate hi and we've got Richard McVittis textile artist hand embroiderer and a prize mentor hello Richard hi everybody hi um and then of course there's Lizzie give us a wave Lizzie hello instrumental the prize coordinator and the person who organized tonight and then finally there is me so um we've got a lot to get through tonight and so i'm going to dive into my first question which um which is for diana uh diana i want to come to you first you've been involved with the hand unlock prize for many years now can you start us off by explaining why you think it's important to have a competition like this with a brief with mentors and why the financial prize really helps? Well, basically, Hand and Lock are supporting embroidery as an art, which really does not happen anywhere else. So it's incredibly important uh, to see it in this individual way. That's what it's doing. Uh, and people who are involved are very proud. And you, as a collector as well, a fairly renowned collector, how does your collecting criteria differ from the standard you hold as a mentor and as a judge? Well, I've collected when I've seen work that I feel, first of all, I, I could never do, and I look at it and say, it's wonderful, I'd never do that. Uh, but I started buying in order to have good teaching aids for my students so that I could take it to my students and say, look at this, look at look how this is done, look how that's done, and talk about the design element. It's the design element, the individual, um, you know, completely uh, visually fresh to the, to the maker. That's interesting because I was actually at the Sir John Soane Museum in London yesterday and he, I, I asked one of the people that worked there, you know, what this room that we were in was for. And it was just 
pieces of work everywhere. You could barely move. You were banging elbows against sculptures. And she said uh, that he brought his students there to be absolutely surrounded, to do their sketching, to be properly immersed. And of course, they were all pieces he'd collected. So I guess maybe being a collector and an educator kind of come hand in hand. Would you say that's fair? Uh, that's fair. And I have a lot of visitors coming to look at the collection. A couple of weeks ago, a group from Canada um, built it into their their in England tour. Uh, so I have a lot of people wanting to look at things because the walls are, are full of all the smaller things. But if they want a particular artist, a, a bigger work, I get it out in good time. But it does mean they can actually look at the history uh, of that artist. Um, some not with us anymore, but top names, our leading names. I've been very lucky to, to know them. Um, I only buy off the artist directly. So it's, it's a personal connection, which again means a lot. They tell me exactly how they've done it. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. Hopefully some people that have entered this year might, might make it into the Diana Springle collection. Um, Kate Bankhurst, I'm going to come to you next. Um, Every year we have entrants from the Royal School of Needlework and as an RSN graduate yourself and, and a tutor, I was curious what it was that you thought was different at the RSN or special about the teaching at the RSN that meant that the students were really good at interpreting the brief and really excelled at the kind of embroidery that, that makes them a finalist in the prize. Mm, that's a really good question. Um, uh... So what is the magic of the RSN? What's the magic of the RSN? What's the magic? What's the magic sprinkled dust? Um, uh, there is, I mean, there are two courses. I mean, two main courses for those who want to take embroidery on as their career. <clears throat> um, so the uh, the professional one, the, we, we, as was known as the Future Tutors, is now the Professional Embroidery and Tutor course. Um, that they, that they, they are very much involved in the the um, mechanic sounds not right at all, but you know the the real sort of um, specialist in making sure that the standard is absolutely as good as it possibly can be. Um, but then overlaid on top of that, um, be, because I am actually mentoring a couple of students this year. Um, through this um which will stop of course once the deadline ends and, and then i become a mentor for for some finalists um but um so i mean having sort of they've got the craft you know they, they've got that craft to a, a really high standard i'm saying is is then to start thinking creatively so i think because they have such an, an incredible grounding in the craft um um as an artist, you know, it, it's almost like the next step. It is like you, you you sit down and you just kind of let your imagination run wild and then you have the skill mm -hmm. to be able to um, make that imagination a, a reality, if you like. You make me almost think of like a lot of the criticisms that were levied against Picasso during like his blue period where it was like a child could paint this and it's like, yes, but a child <laughs> didn't. A, an expert painter who really <laughs> mastered his craft painted it. Mm -hmm. That was because he, he mastered perfection and now he was going into abstraction and conceptual work. And I think yeah. that's maybe yeah. the grounding is in this. It's like the, only the best piano players can play the piano badly, but in a way that amuses people like mm -hmm. yes. we would used to. <laughs> I can kind of understand that. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to go down to you now, Stacey Jones. Um, I was just curious because we've got a lot of artistic practitioners here, but a lot of people that enter the prize are going to be entering fashion garments. And I just wondered how how do you, as a mentor, think you could help someone who had submitted a fashion garment as opposed to uh, an art object? I think um, in many ways there's quite a crossover between the two because there is almost like a piece of art, isn't it? And um, last year um, when I was mentoring in the fashion category, um, there was just, it felt like when um, they were working on the pieces, like they, they almost became like these really intricate pieces of um, embroidery, you know, really layered, really rich, really decadent. Um, and I just think that 
it's almost like I would I kind of don't view it as two separate things if that makes sense I feel like they're quite combined no I, I can see that I think it's almost like the fashion garment's only fashion garment when it's on the body up until that moment it can it could be hung in a gallery it could be anything yeah. um, and I think our entrants probably need to recognize if they're working in the fashion category they're still artists you know they're creating art um, you mentioned layers there, and that just made me think of another question that I, I had for you, which is um, the 2024 brief talks about literal and metaphorical layers. And I feel your embroidery practice embodies these ideas perfectly. And I just wondered if you could share your advice on how to balance the idea of this this layered aesthetic with, with the emotions that come with it. Yeah, I think uh, I made some notes actually before before this and I was thinking about um, making work that's really meaningful and personal I think is key um, and I guess for my own if I was to kind of like offer advice in my own practice it's like I, I everything sort of stems from drawing mm -hmm. and taking photographs and writing and listening to music and things like that and I feel like the more you kind of draw upon you every day, the more kind of ideas that you'll generate and the more that you have to work with. And I noticed that obviously um, with shared Pinterest boards and things like that, which are fantastic. I, I just would say for me, I think the best kind of work goes from the ones that are that's really kind of goes deep into what they're trying to say, rather, you know, and obviously then the aesthetic comes from that starting point. So, for example, um, in my recent work, it, it's all stemmed from like sunflowers and the sim like symbolic meaning of um, growth and um, new beginnings. And I kind of I haven't just got the sunflower as a seed and then I've I've just gone with that. But I'm I'm kind of abstracting it. I'm enlarging it. I'm playing around with it. I'm taking it apart. I'm putting it back together. I'm layering it. Um, and I think that this idea of like transformation and layering and um, like going through processes and even the way that there might be kind of, um, you know, like showing decay or erosion. Um, I feel like all of those things can really come into play, but I, I do think um, I'd written here about like looking at like just the world around you, even the kind of a journey to work or, you know, mm. some something that you see every day. Mm. Uh, Kate, I, I couldn't help but notice you were nodding quite a lot there. Do you have anything? Does that resonate with you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I wrote down the thing that stuck out the most from the brief for me was the palimpsest, like a literal pal palimpsest in an artistic sense I'm really interested in. And I and I think it would be really fascinating to see what that would look like in a textiles form. Um, you know, I know it's like antithesis to sort of what we're used to doing. We hate to do it, but I would love to see um something that is literally picked up like picked out let's yeah. see let's see some really challenging ideas of like what's finish what is what is um resolve what is resolution um let's see the repair let's see the literal decay the, the layers kind of and also as I'm somebody in my own practice who's making um more three-dimensional pieces I'd like to see I'm interested in things that you, that you can actually interact with. So can we actually peel back layers? Can we actually lift things up? Can we see what's underneath? I like that. I like that. And thank you for bringing up the palimpsest. Um, the palimpsest is kind of one of the key words that's that's throwing people a little bit when they read this year's brief. And it's it's a, a great word. You need to go and Google it if you can spell it or look it up on the website. Essentially, it's, a, it's describing a physical scroll from from centuries long gone that would be erased and then rewritten on erased and rewritten on but effectively the final scroll would would hold layers of text that we can sort of still see basically like your search history is never really gone <laughs> is what we're saying here nothing is lost everything can be found um I'm going to stay with you, Kate, if that's OK, because this this brief asks our embroiderers to dig deep and explore their thoughts and feelings. Their submission should provoke, communicate and articulate a strong sense of emotion. Can you tell us how you walk that fine line of mining your emotions for your art 
while protecting yourself. If we're asking people to dig deep, basically, we have to make sure that, you know, people are protected. How do you do that? I think the first thing I would say, and this is probably the headline really of my answer, which is that don't forget that even if you're working in a vulnerable space, or you're putting the artist in the art, your work, the process of working is processing that for you. So I think whilst you're privately working, whilst you're in your studio or wherever you're, you work, whilst you're at home, you pour yourself into it because it is a safe place. And once for me personally, when I've done work that's sort of very emotionally charged and I know other people on the panel work in a similar way, by the time it's sort of shown to the public, um, even if that's just on Instagram, I've already sort of processed it myself. I've, I, it's, it doesn't have the um, potency for me personally anymore um, in terms of it being kind of risky or, but it's got all of that in there. So I think you can really tell when a piece is, is very authentically um, personal and, and when there's been some sort of real catharsis happening with there and within that. And I think, again, that is something that could be beautifully interpreted with this brief by kind of putting something down, taking it away. Um, what would that look like in a physical form? I love that. Thank you. I think stepping away from the, the kind of emotional roller coaster that embroidery can be and maybe touching on the fact that sometimes it can be stressful it can be isolating let's be honest it can be boring um I, i'm just curious uh i mean richard when you embark on a long embroidery project like our finalists are going to how do you stay focused positive how do you stay on track um, yeah, that's a, again a really good question because I think yeah I go through periods of transition, you know, of love and hate with the process because it's it's both a labour of love but also it can be um, labour intensive and quite painstaking. So it demands a certain stamina, mm -hmm. mentally, physically, to mm -hmm. maintain that sort of level of concentration. But I really love what Kate was saying about this idea. Oh, Katie, sorry about this idea of catharsis. And I think, yeah, embroidery is a way of sort of processing um, sort of feelings through material form. So I think that's a really great way of doing it. And uh, yeah, I love this idea of sort of taking something quite personal um, and making it tangible and visible um, to, to, to people. Yeah, I think that's a really, uh, really beautiful thing to, to, to sort of highlight, especially with embroidery or any sort of craft process you know that it, the material um represents that and it represents a sort of changing world and I was sort of thinking about the brief as well and I was thinking about like literal material representation of a changing world that's what got really me really excited and it sort of resonates with lots of themes within my work about layering and time um so I thought yeah it sounds really exciting but the time thing is really great because it makes you meditate in an idea and for me the thinking happens through making um and that that making facilitates that thought that's when I get all of my ideas and I'm able to process that so I I I think even if it's not the final piece of work that you're doing just physically sampling and making will help you resolve ideas well that kind of leads me on to one of the questions I had for you because I think you know, as creative people, you can get very caught up in the conceptual idea. You can be like, you know, what what will this mean? What is the embodied meaning? And obviously we can talk about ritual, but the ritual of creation is, is between you and the object and doesn't necessarily translate when people, you know, see the final product. They might need to be told. They might be able to see it, you know, by looking at it if they've got enough inside information. But I'm just curious, like, that there has to be an extra something. And I'm wondering, with a brief like this, do you have any advice for entrants on how they can balance this conceptual idea, the intellectual ideas, with the need to create a rendered product that still resonates with the audience? That isn't basically so clever that no one yeah. loves it and, and enjoys it just for the sake of it. Yeah, um, I think it's got to sort of inspire a little bit of awe, maybe. I mean, when I go to see a beautiful painting, the first thing that I'm attracted to is sort of the materiality of it, the process, the technique. You know, when I look at a Magnus Martin painting, it sort of invites you to step closer and be there with the person. So I would say artwork, like her work, 
has many different layers. And the first layer, of course, is a visual thing for me. And I'm very honest about that. You know, quite often a lot of the things that inspire me are an aesthetic. Um, and so that is my way into a piece of work. And then beyond that, there are different stages which you could take people on. So if people want to find out more, they can read the, the title or then they can read the text that goes along with it. So there are different ways into a piece of work. And I think that's how perhaps I would advise people to think about this work is think about, of course, what it looks like visually, composition, formal qualities like that, which are really important in my work, how it reacts in a space, whether it's two dimensional or three dimensional. Um, but then think about how you might layer that message on, whether it's through a clever use of materials, what is the material communicating? What does the title say about the piece of work? And then and then what is the, you know, what is the like the text? And you need to be able to explain it in a really simple way for like non-specialist and specialist audiences don't be too clever because i hate that if i go into a gallery and it's too it's too complex i walk out i mean it's just really boring i you know no, i really no, no. more of that i'm an art <laughs> historian if you don't understand the art then there's no use for me i need to explain no no no, no. but it's got to have different layers right for different yeah. types of audiences and i think for those people who really want to dive deep and i am that person because i want to go i want to go in and i want to go deep i want to hear more about a piece of work but it has to have that initial pull you know it's got to have a bit of gravity and and that really for me comes from the aesthetic I think the, the the best example I can think of is is as a child I watched Apocalypse Now and it was like that's an amazing action film. It's Vietnam, things explode, it's brilliant. Then at college we studied Heart of Darkness and, and realized that Apocalypse Now was based on Heart of Darkness, but then it was also based on the Valkyries. And suddenly this film that just seemed to be cool with loads of explosions mm -hmm. in it and helicopters was this multi-layered intellectual thing that as I grew older with the film I started appreciating these other layers but it never took away from the fact that it was just a really cool moving and explosive kind of film when I was a kid so I think that's it you, you maybe your work um, as a finalist has to try and appeal on multiple levels to multiple people which is a big ask um, I'm going to come over to you now Danielle and um, let's talk practical so you've been a mentor for a while. When a new entrant is paired with you for mentoring, can you give us a little outline of that process and, and how it's, it's happened for you in the past? Um, it's varied. Uh, it very much is driven by the entrance. So from my experience so far, so obviously the entrance gets um, accepted and then gets connected with me and then kind of can or with other mentors and can kind of take the initiative on themselves a lot of people don't want any feedback they're like I've got this I'm confident I don't really want to engage with like the mentorship thing and maybe you get have a little bit of back and forth and other people are a lot more interested in kind of diving deeper into their work and getting a lot more feedback it's very much entrance dependent um which is really nice because you get to you you essentially get as much out of the mentor as you want um at least yeah like I said from my experience and then that has been both on a kind of emotional and academic level or just pragmatically like I don't know how to frame this what do you think you know so really it's it's a very open uh fluid and yeah yeah space to to be in I think yeah, that's been my experience and how have you found it have you enjoyed the process of course yeah <laughs> I love connecting with, <laughs> I love connecting with people and like inside their creative journey and kind of seeing where people are coming from and especially with a brief like this which is very much about from the way I'm interpreting it it's very personal you know like and it, it can be really personal and I think your strength would be if that that idea of change comes from something that you really believe in. The brief has got a lot of duality in it. Mm -hmm. It's got a lot of ways that you can interpret it. And I think you have to find something that like is, is yours and, and that like is a story that or a change or some kind of kind of transition that speaks to you. And yeah, I've really loved that personal connection that comes with being inside someone's creative process from previous mentoring. And I think this brief specifically will have a lot of room for that kind of creative connection. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, yeah. On this idea of personal, I want to come back to you, Diana. Um, the 2024 brief has this focus on layers, mark making, history and restoration. And these are quite 
these feel to me like quite non-personal words. Obviously, there can be a personal interpretation, but they almost feel um, gigantic. They feel architectural. And I'm just wondering, thinking of all of these things, how can our entrants ensure that they are balancing maybe these grand concepts with the personal? Like, how do they keep it personal? I think you keep it personal um, through perception. Uh, looking at the different, you know, the, the reasons, the sources for, for the thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, perception, I've always believed, is a key to originality uh, and personal work uh, to actually really look uh, as well as think and make your marks. Uh, I, I would say that's incredibly um, first line for me. Um, if you were approaching this brief where it talks about things like alchemy and using unconventional tools and techniques, what would be your first step? I'd have a go at the different ones and see whether um, I could actually cut them up and layer them and uh, add one to another and see what happened uh, using transparent um, papers, um, different, different materials, and then putting them together in some way and seeing what happened. I'm a, I'm a great one, actually, for cropping and cutting. <laughs> Things will look so different, crop. But you're you're a big painter to begin with. You begin your process typically yes. painting. Yes, yes. What if someone isn't a painter at all? What if they 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 take into embroidery, but they have no skills as a uh, with pens, papers, crayons, or paints? But they're going to have to put down their design idea in some way. So it could be cutting up papers. Um, you know, it could be using found materials or patterned papers, um, but you've actually you've actually got to physically make that design yourself. You you can't completely um, imagine it unless you're ready to put it on your your drawing board in some way, um, ready to actually make that trans you know that transfer. I feel like you're a, a great champion of the of the composition, and I, I've heard you say many times at um, prize giving events, you know, appreciating the composition of a piece and and just those considerations. It's probably impossible to articulate, but I'm going to ask the question: Do you think that there's something that that you can say that makes a good composition? Yes, it's considering your positives and negatives, so that. The space you leave behind. I learned this on my history of art course, not my painting course. Um, in history of art, it was obvious to me that they were really paying attention to the negatives, the spaces left behind. And I learned this, of course, also through studying Japanese work, um, in yo, yin yang uh, in Chinese and Japanese. Um, the positives and the negatives are absolutely crucial and where you put it in your space, what you leave behind is incredibly important. That I think that, is probably that worth, that's worth its weight in gold, that advice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now I wanted to speak to someone who's been on both sides of the process. Um, Kate, you've been a mentor yourself and an entrant just this last year, um, and of course a winner. And so you've seen it all. I just wondered if that changed the way you saw the entrant mentor dynamic. And, and also while you're at it, if you could just explain maybe your journey over the last few years with the prize. Oh, that's you, Kate Hume. Oh, sorry. Just, yeah, sorry, that's me. Um, too many Kates. Too many Kates, that's the read, that's the problem. Yeah, so uh, I have, I think I was, I've mentored, this is maybe my fourth year mentoring um and my work's changed a lot um and I so I suppose my and, and and what I've seen in terms of what finalists I've been put with in terms of what things have changed what trends seem to come through um different responses as just it keeps pushing the envelope in terms of what's possible with embroidery art um I also exhibited at the barge house with Stacy um, and Danielle as well it was a couple of years ago just after Covid and then yeah was and was a finalist and a winner um, in the textile art open category last year as well so I, I would say I'm pretty intimately 
uh, in a pretty intimate relationship with Hand and Lock at this point <laughs> with the prize. So, um, so yeah, and I was I was really nodding along with what Danielle was saying about the mentor mentee relationship because um, it's a mixed bag. I totally agree with everything she said. Um, over the years, I've had some mentees who haven't engaged at all, and some who have, and by you know 100 it's just so much more an enriching experience when they do but what I would say is as a men as a finalist last year having my own mentor um I was able to yeah be on that other side of it and I I want to say to um you know potential entrants today like really do take advantage of that mentor relationship and you know speaking for myself because obviously other mentors may have different ways they want to approach it but uh with my mentor who was Elizabeth Ashdown you know I was like tell me what works for you in the industry you know I'm a professional you're a professional let's have a professional conversation um let's it doesn't have to be about the prize is really what I'm getting at is you know, a lot of people um I think a lot of uh, finalists uh, may feel like like Daniel said oh I'm good I'm I've 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 finished my piece already like I don't need help it doesn't have the mentors can support you with other things we've all been working in textiles for a long time in lots of different places lots of different areas we've had lots of experience ask us about it you know what do you want to do after the prize what's what do you want to do long term like let's have a conversation so it, it's having a mentor I think is like your first prize I feel like if you're a finalist you've won like you get to have access to these amazing industry professionals like what a panel tonight and there's even more mentors you know that aren't here so um you know really take advantage of it don't feel that if you if your creativity feels like it's tied up don't feel like that's therefore this is not kind of useless to you because it really can give you a lot and I think so many people think their fit their work is done and there's no mm. point speaking to the mentor because it's done um even if it is done there's there's other questions you can ask there's the mentor isn't just about this competition and this um opportunity and this this art or fashion object it's about anything you know yeah. maybe just ask them if they've got any good recipes <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 I mean I was saying like oh you know Elizabeth you've got this like um master class on your website how does that work for you is that is that been good like how have you promoted it what have you found has helped how have you gained interior design contacts in your in your resume you know just just really explore really like can make a connection with your mentor is what I would advise and I think the last thing there is that I think for some people particularly maybe students they might feel that you know this mentors on a different level to them you know it's it's intimidating but I think the truth of it is is that you're creative people meeting on a a, a level playing field in reality it Absolutely. is a bit hierarchical thing not at all. And actually, I would go further and say, I'd love to hear from students who want to collaborate. I'd love to, you know, have my masks, for example, on a catwalk with fashion on a, fa you know, I'd love to have conversations with that. And and um, probably the panelists can relate to this at some point, at least in their careers. It's a pretty solo venture. You're in your studio, you're working alone, you're working. It's embroidery is a slow medium. Sometimes you can spend months and years just doing this thing. So having the opportunity to have conversations with creatives from different walks of life is is really valuable no matter what you you talk about thank you very much that was perfect um I think we're just over the halfway mark now and I feel like we just need a little bit of glamour a little bit of sparkling royalty perhaps so I'm going to come to Kate Pankhurst please tell us what is the difference between working on a prize submission and embroidering for an event like the Royal Coronation? Oh. <laughs> you knew you were going to get asked, surely. You know, it's, no, the no, most, really. it's the most fun thing that's happened for a long time in the UK. Dreary, grey UK, and we finally get a coronation. It's something I know, wasn't that yeah. amazing? Yeah. Um, sadly, <laughs> it's like all of these things. I actually can't talk about it. Um, <gasps> we've all signed NDAs. <laughs> But you all, can I, I talk can about. say, I mean, the things that I mean, it was fantastic. I mean, I can, I can talk in a sort of very general way. Um, it was absolutely fantastic. What an opportunity, what a privilege. And um the the robe of estate is literally the most beautiful piece of embroidery I've ever seen. Um, I hope everybody got to see it when it, they were all on display in um Buckingham Palace last summer. 
they're, they're, I think it was only on for about six weeks, which is a crying shame, actually, because it all really needed to be looked at. And beautiful. Um, so, but but um, obviously working on that is a a collaborative effort, you know, sort of I, I am basically a jobbing stitcher on that, you know, as an absolutely privilege and it was beautifully done, but it was great to, you know, actually for the first, sometimes, any time working with a lot of other people. Um, and that is like in absolute contrast to sitting in this room here <laughs> at my slate frame, <laughs> stitching away at, um, at you know, various different projects and uh, you know, commissions, that sort of thing. But, uh, but yeah. No, many people have... So we've got royal commissions, we've got individual commissions, and then you've got the piece that you work on yourself because you've elected to, to enter the prize, which you've done twice. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. both times as well um what does that feel like compared to I mean there's obviously so much uh prestige associated with working on the royal coronation but there must be a different prestige to working on your own winning piece oh yeah no absolutely um oh I mean as I say you know the, the, there is the, the the scale for a start I mean my all my stuff is is sort of life size i would love to do something on a big scale one of these days but i've only got one pair of hands so um and a hand. <laughs> yeah um yeah no so my my, my goldfish was a, an actual life size goldfish but i can't tell you how many hundreds of hours that took <laughs> to produce a gold i mean that was another one whereby there, there were actually about four or five different iterations of that goldfish and that was the final one um it, it it is different. I mean, it's um, it's, it's it seems to be almost like the longest process. Um, Richard, what you were talking about before that that really um, sort of hit, hit home. You know, I mean, it was like that was my experience, whereby you're going through all of these um, emotions, etc. Or, or you know, you're, you're digging deep into a brief, bringing things out and trying to tell your story, but then also you kind of um, there are things that you leave out. Um, that, I mean, this particular brief, I mean, it it really speaks of optimism to me. Um, and that that's really my, that's my wheelhouse. I, I like to invite people in and with beautiful detail and make them smile and make them think, oh, isn't that so, oh, not that that's so nice, but wow, that's, you know, really cool. It makes me feel good, you know, that. So I, I do have a, yeah, I go through all of that that whole process over months and months of loads of tiny little bits of silly goldfish fins, you know, end <laughs> with fifteen of them, you know. Um, but yes, yeah, that, that whole process. makes sense because you're simply more invested in your own work of your own conception that tells your own story, I suppose. But it's nice to get to get both worlds. Definitely. Absolutely. I mean, you know that. I mean, I I don't work for a living. You know that this, this this is not. You know, I can't call this work. I mean, I know that's a bit of a cliche, but I really do love every minute of what I do, um, and it is so varied, um, and so satisfying, and so just heartfelt. You know, it really feels like this is what I'm put on earth to do. You know, but it took me a while. I didn't start stitching till I was in my 50s, you know, so it did take a little while to find all this. <laughs> so. Well, that's a good message to any finalists there now that are thinking of entering the prize because they want to change in career. I've encountered that multiple times over the years with the Hand and Lock Prize, where someone has effectively used the prize as maybe an opportunity to gain the confidence they want to change the direction of their life and um, you know, it, it's it's a possibility. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Richard, because it's been a while, and I wanted to also return to the the subject of of fashion, because I think in this particular group we're going to talk about art, we're going to talk about those kind of processes quite a lot. And I wondered for you what you thought the main difference between embroidery on an art object and embroidery on like a one of a kind fashion garment actually could be, if you can articulate that. Ooh, yeah, I mean, I suppose for me, it's all about context. Okay, so where where do I imagine seeing my piece of 
piece of work, right? So context is everything. So whether you see that on a body, and I think there's no, again, that differentiation is there's not much because I think fashion is art, it's wearable art. Um, it's how people sort of express themselves. But for me, it's about where I'm imagining the work. And when I'm when I'm talking to students, it's always about context because it's relationship to space, um, how it interacts with space. Those are all the things that I'm going to think about. So I, when I'm creating a piece of work, I'm almost immediately thinking about the space that it will inhabit, whether that is going to be a gallery or on a body, or is it on a body inside a gallery? So I think you've got to think about that sort of position of it that, that that's how I would sort of approach it because I think you could make a garment but it could be in a gallery context and you could be performing in it it could be it could be something like that yeah a lot of big fashion brands do mm. want to do collaborations with artists going back countless with Louis Vuitton between the Chapman brothers for example and it's just an ongoing thing we see it all the time and I know you yourself have done a, a collaboration is that right can you maybe give us some insights into that process between the fashion brand and the artist and and who gets what out of that process um, yeah, I mean, I suppose it wasn't, I would say, less of a collaboration in terms of me making work for them, but it was more of a mutual sort of merging of ideas, I think, and sensibility. So that's when, um, you know, I, I'm quite selective who who I might sort of team up with to see if they match my aesthetics or my perception of materials, those sort of things. So I did a collaboration but with not Gigi. Versace then. Sorry? So not Versace then. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe so. maybe not. Although I'm open, yeah. okay. If they're <laughs> on the call, yeah, I'm willing to give it. A, I'm sure there's something I could wear, like a beautiful tailored Versace suit. I'll give it a go. No, I think uh, yeah. I mean, they're, they're not throwing themselves at me. I've only had like maybe two, but you know, when someone approaches me, it has to be a sort of a mutually beneficial gig. And if it's a brand that I aspire to that inspires me, then of course I'm gonna I'm gonna find sort of similarities. And the Muji project was really interesting because. Um, um, they asked me my first experience of that brand and it was like 20 years ago and I, I'd made a pencil case, um, this piece of art and it was it was from a Muji pencil case which I bought and so it was my first almost piece of work and I'd taken deconstructed their pencil case and they were thrilled by that but I was more thrilled that they were asking me so there was a there was it was meant to be um, it's sort of written into that into that pencil case yeah so it has to sort of match my sort of sensibilities I think. Thank you. Thank you. Stacey, I'm going to come back to you as well. Um, putting aside the prize fund, which obviously is, is not insignificant at all, and the exposure, which we've already talked about, you know, it can change things. Putting those things aside, what do you think is the main benefit of entering something like the prize just for the individual, the embroiderer themselves? Putting aside, let's say they don't become a finalist, is there value in just going through this process? Yeah, I think like you'll end up learning a lot about yourself and your practice and how it evolves, um, you know, building in confidence, net, you know, and kind of putting yourself out there. Um, I think it's always really difficult, like when we were talking earlier about personal work or making something and you, you kind of, once it's out there, you're exposed. And I think just kind of throwing yourself in there and seeing what's the worst that can happen, basically, you know, I think that would be where I would go with that do you think a lot of people are held back by fear yeah definitely last year I had uh, a few people message me saying I don't know if I'm good enough uh, to enter it and things like that and I just I, you know I urged everybody to just go for it like what you know like I say like you, you just need to try I think I mean I think I've, I've applied for the Royal Academy every year and I've always <laughs> keep getting rejected and I think uh, you know it's just like just keep going like I think yeah it's a character building well following on from that to all the other mentors maybe an open question what kind of questions from your mentees do you get asked maybe what questions surprise you wow no so no one's been stumped or upset by a question that they may have heard I'm just wondering if there are more instances where you know people really are showing their vulnerability when they're talking to you yeah i mean i i, I would <clears throat> i would agree with some of the points that um 
the panelists made about them feeling a little bit intimidated about talking to us. And sometimes there's sort of there's a fear there of asking us questions. But we are, you know, we've been in that place. And also, you know, I it's quite good to share my vulnerability with them as well. You know, every day I sort of I didn't get to the RA show either. You know, I mean I've tried all the time. So <clears throat> it's good to show that, you know, we are also artists and we are also creatives and designers and we go through this constant sort of idea of imposter syndrome. I think it's a natural process and to share that with a mentee is 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 really important. And and then to um Stacey's point about um you know why apply I mean the brief is really exciting. I think sometimes a brief pushes you in a different direction and it makes you take risks and take chances. And I think some of the best work I've made is when I've responded to a brief because it's made me think about something in a very different way. Mm -hmm. And and they're really great because they're sort of trajectories which you can't really plan for. So I think it's worth sort of diving into those mm -hmm. in depth and, and taking that risk. I think it's you've got to sort of build and it also it helps you build up your resilience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because if you're gonna be a creative, you're gonna to have to develop a little bit of thick skin. Not everyone's gonna like your work straight away. It might not be your time in the world to have your work there. So you've got to sort of apply yourself. Um, and it's good practice, I think. It's absolutely good practice for all of that, yeah. I mean, for the viewers at home, um, just for honesty, I don't embroider. I'm a writer. And uh, often when we have these conversations, I know about embroidery. I've, I've been in around embroidery long enough. I've been writing about embroidery. But the, the conversations that we have in these rooms, there's so much crossover with the world that I've inhabited for the last 15 years and when you talk about you know pushing yourself part of the writing process is you know write a western you'd never write a western but you sit down you write a short story about a western and you stretch a muscle and then it says write a Mills and Boone style romantic novel and you go oh I don't want to do this it's disgusting but you do it and you stretch a muscle and you learn something in the process and then when you go back to writing what you want to write about you've got new you've you've exercised new muscles you've got kind of new stronger reflexes so I can't help but think that that's a little bit of what you're talking about you know the brief allows people to go outside of their comfort zone stretch themselves try something different um for from the last few minutes I think some of the conversation has kind of gone around this idea of you know protecting yourself and being vulnerable but I'm quite interested in uh, Danielle Clough and the persona of Fiance Knowles. Now, <laughs> I can't help but think, you know, the real Beyonce has Sasha Fierce. A lot of big artists have like a persona. I was just curious if Fiance Knowles, in a way, was a persona that maybe you used to sort of navigate the complexities and the stresses of the industry. Um. So, in all honesty, Fiance Knowles came up as a joke. So it was somebody, so it was just like a nickname that I got and my Instagram picked up kind of overnight and it was just my Instagram hat. It was from when I used to VJ at events. Um, and as my kind of, I, my work went viral and it just, everything like escalated really quickly. And I was like, oh, well, if I change my name, I've got to change it now to like my name and my artist name, my real name, you know? And I kind of decided that Beyonce Knowles was just light and funny. And it, I kept it almost as a way to, make sure that I didn't take myself too seriously mm. so it's it, it's kind of added as like a little bit of a reminder a little bit of like a humbling um stopper or a regulator or something like that so when, every now and then if I do start finding myself like really taking myself seriously I'm like well you are kind of Beyonce Knowles like rein it in you know what you're about and I I know like I'm very aesthetically driven like Richard was saying earlier like that's kind of what draws me into things and and I like like color and I like big thick thread and I you know and and it it comes with a certain lightness that I think that the the Sasha Fierce kind of Beyonce Knowles name gives me so it's not a persona but it's definitely a reminder just to like take it easy. Do you think that our entrance and uh, finalists this year could actually do, do you think it's horses for courses? Do you think everyone could go, I'm going to create a persona and embroider? Or do you think it's just circumstance and if it's right and if it if it feels right? You know, I've been thinking about the brief and kind of like how when I look at the brief, I think that there's so much in it, right? You can really 
be taken in any direction. So as much as a brief is like a guardrail, it's a beautiful thing because you that's what I love about briefs, like Richard was saying, like it can set you in a, court, on a, in a direction, but this brief is really open. And I think the thing that resonates, would resonate with me and resonates with me within the brief is the kind of, that you can really tap into something within yourself, like a memory and aspects of yourself, aspects of something that really resonates with you and, and lean into that. And I think it's the same when it comes to like how you decide to develop your career, how you decide to develop your business, your persona, your artwork, your craft. It has got to be honest. Like mm -hmm. you have got to be honest with yourself, whether you are an absolute fool and, you know, would like to just like do everything in bright pink and green, then that's that's you and lean into it and there are people who are going to connect to that and if your work is all in grayscale and monochromatic and tiny and small and delicate like Richard's and you can just and he has this whole world that he builds inside of that then and and people resonate with that because it's honest and it's real and I think that no matter how you decide to take this brief your career everything just really find the thing that speaks to you find the thing that sparks joy lean into that and you're going to find answers inside of yourself. And then you're going to find questions like that are going to come up within that. And then that's going to be what builds your practice, your work, your project. That okay. is beautiful. Great life advice, not just <laughs> okay. prize advice. Um, I have more questions here, but I don't think I can hog the questioning. I think it is time for us to hand over to some questions from the audience. Uh, Lizzie, have we had any good questions? I'm sure we've had loads. Yes, we do. I've been dropping them in your chat box. Okay. okay, I'm going to have a little scan here. I feel like I should make some lift music. Or you could go into the question and answer box at the bottom and I've left them open for you to open. Right, okay, let's start with Carol Elaine. Hello, Carol, how are you this evening? We can't hear you, but we know who Carol Elaine is. She's been a former prize mentor herself. Um, her question is, how do you find the physical act of making can steer the intention of what you foresee the finished work, positively or negatively? I'll just read that again. How do you find the physical act of making can steer the intention of what you foresee in the finished work positively or negatively i think this is really about the physical process and sometimes how that can be quite taxing on the body i think i'm going to send this one diana we haven't heard from you for a bit <laughs> i'm still here <laughs> and, and i know from visiting that you had this ginormous studio and that you were up ladders and that your process over the years has been incredibly physical at time to time so can you answer Carol Lane's question? How does the physical act steer the intention of the work? Oh, it's it's in, absolutely integral um, because you, you you have a plan, but when you physically come to carry it out, uh, you're, you're going to make um, adjustments and changes, um, especially on very large scale stuff. Uh, so you are developing as you go, as far as my work has been, definitely. Yes, it's um when was the last time you were I, up a ladder doing something dangerous with embroidery? Uh, well, I used to make carpets. That's the the reason that I had to be up a full full size scaffolding um working with punched uh punching with making carpets, yes. So no. I think it, I, I think that makes absolute sense. Thank you for that. I've got a question here for Katie too, although it just moved, but it was there. There it is. Um, question for Katie. Uh, so this person, Christine Van Springle, she read an article about you in textile in a artist textile artist org um your create your search for creative voice speech to me enormously. I have the same vision you did, namely to make something small so it can sell smell sorry there's a typo there how did you manage to let go of the fear of not being visible so you could be recognized as an artist and dare to make great creations oh thank you for that question um well firstly if i'm if i'm hopefully this is not too cheeky but i've actually um been on jamie chalmers needle exchange podcast today the second part came out and i talk about this quite a lot um because yeah my my 
like more than a decade ago when I was first sort of really rediscovering my creative voice having gone through sort of mainstream school uh, I don't have a, um, a a traditional arts degree although I do have an arts adjacent degree but I really felt like uh, school taught me that I wasn't creative and I, my creative voice became very quiet and very small and um so when I first started really feeling like, you know, the, the artist is still within me and it needs to come out and it wants to come out. Um, I had to I had to make things small to make them commercial. I had a lot of, you know, I think this is all to do with capitalism and, you know, you must be productive and you must things have, must have value and things you must be able to produce things in a certain amount of time so that you can charge appropriately for it. Um, it's very, very difficult. And my answer really was that you just get bored of it and you just you just you just have to make what you want to make inside and just be authentic exactly like what Danielle was saying you know honest and real and that is what people will resonate you must be truthful you must be truthful in what you're making you know I know it it, it can be like a hard slog it can be a long journey it can feel a bit disheartening hearing this advice of like the right people will find you eventually but probably everybody on this panel would say that is true because, you know, when you're making your own truthful work, th there's nothing worse than producing something. And I've done it where you're just like, it's it's fine, but it's just not actually what I really want to do. What I really want to do is like crazy, massive, maximalist, colourful, um, you know, bonkers stuff that I've not seen before. Um and I don't know who's going to like it. And I don't know if it'll sell or be commercial or be popular, but I have to express that true voice. Otherwise something dies inside you a little bit, I think. Thank you. I, I mean, that was a good question. So thank you. <laughs> it was, thank you, yeah. Um, there's a question here for Richard. Um, so this is Christine Van Springle again. Um, for Richard, I really appreciate what you are doing. When I look at your work, I feel a purity that leaves room for the imagination. There is no visual pollution. So my question is, how do you manage to structure your embroidery in such a meticulous way when creation generally pushes the mind in all directions? This is about discipline. Wow, yeah. Oh gosh, that's a good question as well. Dis yeah, absolutely about discipline. Um, I mean, I would say my aesthetic has sort of grown over the years, um, so it didn't just sort of spring up out of nowhere. And I love what Diane is saying about sort of the Japanese sense of space. And I think that's, a, you know, a lot of a lot of it comes from what, knowing when to stop and knowing when to step back and allow that sort of negative space to speak talk and and, it, and it, it would be worth pointing out that I've made a lot of really bad work I just don't show it okay so there has been times when I've made work which has taken six months and it and it's really just not been successful you just get to see all the good things so um I really appreciate that I mean yeah the visual pollution thing is that's just my aesthetic there is a sort of balance there and it's so hard to explain because it's something I've sort of honed and crafted over the years it's sort of an intuition um, and I don't, and, you know, I don't always get it right. And I think, uh, you know, I, you know, I take a lot of photographs. So that's, that's a really good way of practicing, um, sort of honing that idea of composition. Again, this idea of composition, formal qualities of creating art. That's how I get that sort of balance. I think it's, is is really good. Um, and this idea of, I think, what was the less part that sort of generally pushes the mind in all directions? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it, uh, you know, as I said, I use the process of making to think about all the things that I'm interested in, right? So I'm also reading, I'm listening to podcasts, I'm drawing sources from all over the place. So it's not just the embroidery that's informing me. It's, I, I have a genuine, um, you know, I am, I mean, I'm inquisitive about the world around me. And so the art is a way, a way of trying to understand that. So I'm drawing inspirations and ideas from all over. I hope that sort of answer that question I, I really think it does I hope it does anyway um I, I mean I have a general question maybe for the group and, and anyone can just pop their hand up if they feel like they can answer it but I feel like I, I'm aware of all of your your aesthetics all of your work and I'm curious to know I mean this isn't really a prize related question but I think it will probably make a lot of people at home maybe feel seen or normal who feels that they live their life maybe in a very different way to the aesthetic of the work that they create. And by that, I mean, 
Um, you know, maybe your embroidery is kind of chaotic and colorful and flamboyant, but you've never worn color in your life and you live in a minimalist house. Like, <laughs> okay, we've got a hand up there. Go ahead, Stacey. I think sometimes what happens with me is I end up wearing the colors that I'm making the artwork <laughs> in. So like subconsciously start getting some really larry colors popping up in my lo in my wardrobe or like it, i don't know richard do you kind of have quite a like your interior <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. really kind of like it's got that really nice style that, like the embroidery you know like kind of minimal That's just and... we can see what we yeah. Have it, uh, <laughs> yeah i would say um it doesn't always match that because i love things i love objects and mm. stuff so i'm I mean, there's definitely a sense of style in the way I sort of arrange and curate things because that's just the way I, you know, I like organizing things and I do that in my work, whether that's 2, 2D or three-dimensional space. So it does, you know, it, it it's not just something I put on show as an artist, I sort of live it. Um, but I would say I'm not like those people who live in those super minimal worlds with just like a book in the corner and a chair and you know like a John Pawson is it John Pawson is that the interior designer like these amazing spaces I was like oh I wish I could live in that space but there's no way because I love things yeah. you know I've got like a shelf full of like mugs and piles of magazines everywhere and you know that I love all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. so um just need drawers. Hard. you know my work is where I try and sort of it's my resting space it's where I try and um try and become a little bit more zen you know it's the counterbalance to all the other stuff that i've got in my life i think there's a lot of nodding going on is is anyone else quite keen to sort of say it's normal to maybe have contradictions between yourself and your art or have similarities between your life and your art i feel i'm laughing because i feel like blimey god if i lived my life with this like giant massive pink moth head on like <laughs> i'd probably get taken away in a van somewhere but um mm. but i am i was thinking though but seriously because um in my interior life because a lot of the work that i make is like about dreams that i've had or it's about trying to make tangible emotions that i'm having um or feelings or processing or things like that so i think um I do like color and I do, you know, like texture and I do have a lot of that kind of stuff in my interiors and in my, in my, I have a lot of art on the walls, it, it, you know, a lot of pictures on every wall. And so that probably is indicative of like what my style of work is. But, um, but I do think the work I make now, there's more artist in the art than there's ever been. Um, but it's very much more about my uh, subcon, my unconscious and subconscious life being made sort of material it sounds like we should do a house swap we totally should <laughs> Danielle, because I just... this this iconic arch window that I've been seeing on Instagram for about oh. a decade I'm like it's there it's in there <laughs> yeah there's the ocean on the other side of it but also all my walls are full of art and I I my work is like directly an extension of my material and color hoarding mm -hmm. it's like I buy stuff and then I'm like oh I've got to use it now and then I kind of try and a solution to all the things that I love buying, just even if it's wool or fabric or and colors. And I'm like, oh, no, I paint. I buy paint. I don't paint. So now I have to learn <laughs> to paint, you know? So, yeah, my work is more of a, of a, of an expression of like everything that I'm building. And mm -hmm. it's yeah, just a place to put all the stuff that I love. I would say my studio is really more of an extension of my art practice. Like it's very, curated and you know it, it's this sort of 3d almost you know room size version of my sort of cubes maybe is is my studio and then I arrange things within that so everything is very muted in there but it doesn't sort of it does filter out a little bit but if you live with other people you know you've got to compromise yeah. so the control freak of me <laughs> um is being held at bay you know so uh, I have to compromise on you know house things <laughs> I, I, well, I think I can kind of join in here as well. I've, I've always been a big believer that I'll write more clear, crisp prose if I've got a tidy desk. And yeah. I have a glass desk and I try just to have a keyboard and a mouse mat on it and a notepad. And the moment it starts to get cluttered, I find myself writing more messy, overloaded sentences. I'm using too many exclamation marks. I think there is that reflection between the environment and the work. Um, uh, but yes, I, I, I mean, I would probably be wildly inspired if I went and visited some of your houses and probably do some of my best writing. And I'm going to return to the brief for a moment with one question. First of all, I'm going to throw this one to you, Kate Pankhurst. 
and um, just but then I think other people might want to con contribute as well. But you'll you'll really I think you might realize why this question was written for you. So the 2024 brief asks embroiderers to look at their environment, the landscape, the forest and the city to look for signs of the past and the present. Mm. But how important is it to the creative process to get out and explore the world? So this is a two part question. Why am I asking you? And why is it important to get out and explore the world? <laughs> That's a, a very good question. I'm not absolutely certain. I was thinking about lockdown the clock and thinking about when you were kind of isolated and, and getting out of the house was so important to your yeah. creative process. Yes, 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 of course. Um, uh, yes, I mean, so that was... Um, almost actually the whole of lockdown o'clock because on the back of it is what I could see from my flat is literally just the balcony and then um uh tower blocks and things in the background so um yeah um it it, it is I mean because you know your environment your home or uh, wherever you are affects you so much um and of course that that time in lockdown meant that we could all We've all spent all of our time in, in you know, in our homes. and But you, you do then start to have time to look around you and appreciate the, um, just the ordinary dull things like pigeons, you know. So my clock has pigeon wings, you know, for example. Um, even though I'm chasing, I'm still chasing them off the balcony to this day. But um, uh, yeah, so yeah, your environment, yeah, it is... Um, it, it's there I mean it also I mean you know so my environment is not very exciting you know, if, you know I can't see you know wildebeest majestically sweeping across the plain out there or anything but it's finding that beauty wherever you are you look um, and you can sit with something and, and just let it wash over you and and find that meaning and see how it speaks to you you know so um, and that's exactly what it did, you know, and it's um, and it worked out my little tiny world in a clock. So. I think Stacey's got something to add to that. <laughs> yeah, it's just made me think because my A-level students have um, been given their exam papers and one of the themes was the mundane and mm. nearly all of them have gone for it. But it's so accessible just to kind of um, look around the everyday and then find like inspiration, you know, and I don't know if you, um, William Eggleston's photography, you know, the kind of like photograph in the mundane and the kind of colours like on a, um, like a diner table and things like that, or a bit of rubbish that's discarded in the street that might have a story attached to it. Um, that's been quite brilliant, seeing the things that they've found so far with their like photo shoots and drawings. Um, so I think it's this, I think this brief is really brilliant for this year. I feel like it's got, it's got a lot. Um, the prize brief as well as the exam. So actually, that's probably a good person to look at for this brief, looking at the mundane, um, looking at photography, thinking about like layers of meaning as well as like actual physical layers in the final work. So I think I'm almost out of questions. Have we got any more questions from the panel or is it time to hand over to Lizzie to tell us about prize discount codes? Yeah, we'll go to Lizzie. Yeah, okay. Uh, let me share my screen. But massive thank you so far to everyone for their questions and to all our mentors for their wonderful answers. There we go. Can you see all that? That's this evening. Yep. So for anyone that isn't aware, this is Kate Pank, uh, Kate, oh, that was Kate Pankhurst's piece. Now this is Katie Toome's piece. Yes, sorry, I can't go back now. <laughs> We're rattling through them. Okay, I'll leave it to you, Lizzie. I'm going to shut up for a minute. Okay, so registration is still open and it's open until the 3rd of April, which is Wednesday after the Easter weekend. Uh, the prize fund is currently at $36,000. And we do have um, associate awards uh, from the Royal School of Needlework, Wilcom 
our textile art and fashion category, uh, the broderers, uh, the gold and silver wire drawers, and this year we have a new one from Jolinson Fabrics, which are offering a thousand pounds worth of fabrics uh, to the winner for that. All the other prizes are worth also a thousand pounds as well. And these are the crack, I can't say the word, commemorative uh, embroidery awards as well that go with first, second, and third prize as well. Mm. These are made by the Hand and Lock team. And first step for registration is uh, this page here. So you need to choose whether you're going to be a student or an open category. Uh, so students are anybody that's in um, education at the time of registration. It doesn't matter if you're out of education by the time that the prize comes to its uh, finish. So it's just at that point. Uh, so that's your first choice, student or open. And then your second choice is fashion or a textile art category. So fashion category is anything that you wear and you have to make a complete outfit uh, from it. Not everything has to be embroidered, but you do have to have a complete look. Um, and then for everything else, we have the textile art category, which can include jewellery, accessories, uh, 3D art, board art, and anything else that technically doesn't fit into the fashion category. Um, just want to run through the online submissions. So this year we're only uh, accepting four images to be uploaded. Um, with these all need to be JPEG and possibly square. Um, and the first one, we want to see the concept of your design. So the beginning where you started. Uh, the second one would be samples or progress where you'll be heading. So the middle of your story. Um, the third image, we recommend a close up of your work, something that you feel is important for the judges to see. And the fourth image, we would hope that it's finished, but you don't have to have a finished piece at all. It could be work in progress or another kind of image that will represent where your work will be uh, when you want to have it completed. Um, we are not accepting multiple images for two, three and four because over the years the images have got smaller and smaller and smaller and the judges just can't see the detail and seeing as embroidery is so small in some areas we want to we want to see the details um, so please you know nice clear images. Uh, so this is a suggestion for image one. Uh, so you can do a multiple image on the first one just to give concept of where you're going and where you're heading. Uh, this could be an option for your middle, middle story. So this would be uh, samples, uh, progress. Uh, this one could be a close-up so you can see the details. And then this one, like a finished piece. Um, there is also a place to explain your work along with each of the photos as well. So please do not put text on the photos. Um, make it, just keep it simple. Um, there are no trick questions. Uh, there are, you don't have to use exactly 200 words. I will not count that you've got exactly 200 words. I have hundreds of applications to go through, so I'm not going to spend my time counting words. <laughs> Just make sure you don't go crazy. You have 200 words per image to describe uh, anything that you need the judges to know on your connection to the brief as well. I'm just going to interrupt one second just on those 200 words, if that's OK, because yeah. I think sometimes um, entrants underestimate the importance of those 200 words that can really direct the judges so they understand your work, but it also is ultimately used on the website or it can ultimately be used in the brochure. So that final two, that 200 word text can be what's in the brochure that's given out at the final event. So make sure it's good, make sure it's right. But also we do give you a chance to change that for the brochure as well. So it's not all, it's not the end and everything. Um, but what I'm trying to say is 
it's not a trick question. We're not expecting you to answer anything in any, any particular way. Don't tie yourself up in knots on filling the form in. Just speak as a human. We don't need to even have arty farty words and sentences. It's just simple. Mm. Keep it simple. And that's how we would like to see it. Um, just tell your story. And that's all we're looking for, really. Uh, and lastly, um, this is our last orders. So as we're closing the prize for uh, the 3rd of April, if you go and uh, register this evening and all the way through to tomorrow night, one minute to midnight, you can get £5 discount off uh, open category and student category. Um, so use the word last orders. So L A S T O R D E R S. And that should be applied in the discount code area. And it will not be extended past this point. This is the very, very last special code. So if you're on the line, go for it. Mm -hmm. Oh, and there's one more thing. While you're all talking about judging and everything, I'd just like to say that when all the work comes in and all the submissions happen, I make a huge presentation. Then these presentations go out to each of the judges. Uh, the judges see those uh, images that you're sent and the, and the words and everything. They go through and they mark them out of zero to 10. Um, so nobody has um, gets through just on one judge's choice. We then collate all the judges uh, scores together and it is the top six out of the category um, so if you don't get through this the 2023 lot it was incredibly close there were like people with marks between one and two um, so if you don't get through this year try try again because it's not that we don't love your work we really really do it just can get very competitive sometimes so keep trying and keep applying because we just love to see your work. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Can I get my mentees, my mentors back? There we are. <laughs> I can see you all again. Um, I just wanted to end at this point with just a big thank you to everyone. So thank you, Diana. Thank you, Kate Toom. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Kate Pankhurst. It's too many Kates. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Lizzie, for organising everything. And thank you to everyone for attending this evening. And if you're in any doubt about whether you should enter the prize for 2024, it's last orders, capital letters, last orders, enter tonight. And maybe you'll be one of the recipients of your share of $36,000. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much to thank everyone you. tonight. Thank, thank you, thank Robert. You. Thank you Thank very you. much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good Thank you, Lizzie. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.